Welcome to Tools to Ready the Journey, a conversation to help prepare and support young men for fatherhood. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Tools to Ready the Journey, a father's guide to a faith-filled family. If you listened to our first episode, I am so grateful that you have returned and are listening to the second one now. Um, For those of you who don't know yet or that you've stumbled upon this second episode first, we are working with author Ray Haywood, and we're also talking with him about his book, Tools to Ready the Journey, A Father's Guide to a Faith-Filled Family. This book is a treasure trove for young men who are looking to find their place in the world, looking to make their place in the world, and also raise good, holy men up in their own families. So, Ray, it's a pleasure to have you joining me again for this discussion, uh, Episode 2, Chapter 2. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for this time and fellowship as we grow together as brothers in Christ. Absolutely. And, Ray, in this second chapter, uh, which is entitled, Our Thoughts Are Not Our Own, you have used the image in the book of a screwdriver. What is the meaning of that screwdriver uh, in this in this artwork? And why do you use it for this chapter, chapter two, our thoughts are not our own? Well, I hope that the message that will be taken away from our conversation today is that uh, we get to choose in our exercised free will what we allow to be driven down into our will. And um, the awarenesses that will be shared in our conversation will bring this to a new realization. Um, And I'm looking very forward to uh, living through this with you, Bill. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, one of the key points of your book you open with, if we believe in God, then we must believe in the devil as well. And, you know, um, that's an uncomfortable thought for a lot of people. It's a thing that we don't often like to think about. Um, but as you just noted, we we get to choose what we dri- drive down into our own will, and that's the reason why those screwdrivers are there. Um, we get to choose um, whether we uh, have virtue or we uh, stumble into vice. And it's based on our choices. But as you, as you mentioned, though, you know, if we believe in God, we have to believe in the devil. And they are real, right? Both of them are real. They have real impacts in our life, right? There's a lot for us to wrap our minds around to come into the awareness that our thoughts are not our own. Many truths need to be explored for us to come into the free will to discern this objectively, in objective truth. Um, The world that we live in, uh, our physical lives, uh, Public Square teaches us that we're not supposed to intently think about um, God or the devil. And that's intentional. And that's a strong point that hopefully will be uh, accepted as we grow through exploring this chapter. Because even in me sharing this, I'm sure that some young men are going to hear just the word devil and be turned away from the content. Stay with us. Journey with us so that you can come closer to the awarenesses that we are going to draw out and and bring forward into your conscious, taking away from the subconscious, things that you've already thought about, but they just weren't close to the surface of your consciousness. I promise you that the things that we discuss today are going to be things that you've already thought about that we are just going to scratch and bring to your awareness. And it's going to be a beautiful thing to see to fruition. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that the 
the world doesn't want you to think about either one of them, right? It's almost, it, it reminds me of the, of the song, and I'm, I'm going to uh, go back into uh, the oldies of the Beatles here for a moment. Uh, so, so some of our younger listeners might not quite remember it, but the Beatles are pretty popular. So I, I want you to uh, look up the song on Spotify or on Amazon Music or whatever you're using. I want you to look up the song Imagine right by John Lennon and and when you and when you think about that song imagine it imagine there's no heaven imagine there's no hell right and that that is a cultural untruth that is being perpetuated that, that's what our culture is singing it's been singing it since since right about then right since the 1960s it's been singing that song right and it's been covered by many people it's been redone and when you look at that what kind of impact does that have on society, Ray? When, when, when you indoctrinate people with that message of there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no God, there is no Satan, all we have, all we have on this planet is what we have in this moment. That's all we're guaranteed. What, what is the problem so, with that? It's, it's funny that you mentioned that song, Bill, because... I listened and sang that song uh, until my late forties and thought nothing of the words. It was only when I came into my uh, owning my own faith that I understood what the message was that was being shared. And uh, that's exactly what I'm trying to, uh, that, that was my first statement about how we scratch the surface and we bring things to awareness in sharing these truths of exploring this chapter of our thoughts not being our own. That song sings into our subconscious and for some people into their will that there's no God and that there's no heaven. But yet many people who are gonna are listening to us right now are going to have to go back and listen to that song to understand what you and I are sharing. It's only when we step closer to our faith that we can come into this realization of listening and being aware to the different things that penetrate us, the stumbling blocks, the dividing wedges um, of living in and of this world, instant gratification in our physical lives, uh, not noticing the spiritual elements around us that are constantly stirring. Um, they're there, but if we're not aware that they're there, they're just as unnoticed as the lyrics of that song. Beautiful. Yeah, exactly right. And when you, and when you, uh, is that what you mean also by our thoughts are not our own? Because, because we have been so um, indoctrinated and just brought up in this, in this culture, it's almost like a fish being uh, in in a bowl of water, they don't recognize that they're in it until they're out of it, right? And and by scratching the surface and bringing it to the awareness, and you say, "Hey, wait a minute! I I've woken up from this, um, from this bad dream of our culture that's out there." When 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 you is that what you mean by our thoughts are not our own? Because uh, because I think that's a that's a question some people might have when they look at the title. Wait a minute! I I know what I'm thinking. I know it's in my own head, but but. On a, on a grander scale of the culture, what's going on in the culture, is that kind of what you mean? So with just those two points explored, I don't feel as though I could answer your question just yet. Okay. What I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is continue on with all of the points that we're going to hit on, and then I would be able to say, yes, this is my view of how our thoughts not being our own. Like, let's explore this. Good. Our, soci our societal view of faith-filled people is that they are weak and, ir and irrational. Yes. For example, one of the ways that um, the world separates us is by um, perpetuating that multiple faith practices. Uh, how, how could there be so many truths? So if all of them are true, then in fact, none of them can be true. And this is used as a tool to divide and confuse and separate us. Society uh, holds up as the true intellects 
that are smarter than any intolerant religion, especially the Catholic faith. We are, the Catholic faith is looked at in the public square as an old, dead tradition that's intolerant. I don't know how anybody who has a faith that I share that could ever see that to be true, but when you're not close to your faith, when you don't invest in your faith, when you don't understand what the difference between situational truth and objective truth is, it's easy to follow the lead of living in and of this world rather than in and of the word. And um, so how did this point of view become the norm? I believe it's through generations of manipulation. Many generations now. Uh, you think back on just the last five years, how so many things have changed in the public square on how we view gender and how we view sexuality and, and marriage and all of these points. And boy, oh boy, five years changed so much. What's in front of us? And if we, men like you and I, don't take our place in this world and bring these points to view so that men can discern them well, then we are not doing our job in furthering our faith. So free will allows us to choose our own direction in our physical world. Uh, and we become aware of these choices as we explore our faith. Satan knows that it's easier to tempt to vice rather than embrace virtue. And he plays on us with that. Yes. Think about that statement. What do we want? We want, especially the younger generation that are working on gathering rather than their spirituality. They want instant gratification. It's what this world treats, teaches them. So it's so much easier to embrace vice rather than work at and chip away at virtue, especially when this world teaches that there's no consequence for our action. Yes. We as human beings have an uh, innate, sense of right and wrong. It's built into our DNA. Our Father gives it to us in love so that we can discern we know right from wrong. So we're created in our, the image of our Heavenly Father. It's just within us. Yes. Um, we need to become aware of what a sinful mindset looks like. Um, by discerning the sinfulness in the world around us, by intentionally separating ourselves from sin and situational truth and moral relativism. Um, it, it compromises our innate sense of right and wrong, uh, and, and it's no longer easy for us to decipher what's right and wrong, especially when we can look around uh, and see that everything around us looks fine. So what do we do then? We begin to test our own limits within our own will because there's no consequences to be found yeah well and you know what the other thing is too i and, and i love this line from from the book it's almost like you left this off right here vice gets cast in a virtuous hue and we imitate the behaviors embraced by those we perceive to be smarter happier people so the world i i love that line because the, the, that line says to us, right, virtue gets cast in a virtuous hue. hue. So it, it becomes that it's hard to distinguish between what is right and wrong in our society. And we begin then to see, okay, well, those people over there, they look really happy. They, they don't have as many problems as I do. And the rest of the world is telling me that in order to be happy, I have to do what the world says. And our own perception, because the world keeps feeding us that, becomes warped. Perception is not always reality, right? But, but there's the line that perception is reality. People love to use that line. So when we blur the lines between vice and virtue, between uh, sin and sanctity, when we view, when we start blurring those lines, then what ends up happening is we get led down the path that we find ourselves on now, right? We are, we are now in this culture 
that of moral relativism, of relativism that says, I define what is right and wrong based on my personal feelings and not based on the, ob the objective truth. You know, that, that's one big point that I want to make to young adults is that truth is not subjective. No matter how you cut it, truth cannot be. It, it's impossible for the truth to be subjective, right? I had a very smart Jesuit priest when I was visiting colleges. I'll just tell you this story. Um, I had a very smart Jesuit uh, priest uh, when I was visiting colleges, a college that I actually did not get accepted to. I went, uh, but I went to this interview uh, to interview with this priest by the name of Father James Mazik, and he he put an OxyClean bottle on on his desk, and he said, "This is truth. No matter what you do, you can't change the truth. You can look at it from all different perspectives." You can see it from 12 different ways. In other words, I'm a Catholic priest. I'm seeing it from this angle, and you're a, a, a college student, prospective college student, looking at it from a different angle. But you can't change it. No matter, no matter how you get around it, truth is always objective. And and when you awaken yourself to that, as, as Ray kind of pointed out, as you awaken yourself to the reality that, that that's what is actually real, <laughs> um, and you're no longer that fish in water, that you end up realizing the power that that gives you in your life through the Holy Spirit. There's, there, and, and truly, that was an awakening moment for me in my journey of faith, because uh, when, when he did that, he showed me, you know what? There is this truth. It really exists. And no matter what, you can examine it, you can look at it from every different angle in your, in your life. But you can't change the fact that truth exists. And he used an OxyClean bottle, which I still laugh about every day. And uh, I... And I and, and in times that I've used that with young, other young adults, and I've and I've done it. I've used everything from my Alexa Amazon speaker to a beer bottle with young adults at a bar. But it either exists or it doesn't exist. And when you find out that it does exist, it makes it all the more real. Uh, your life all the more real because it adds purpose, meaning as you begin to uncover it and look at it and examine it from all the different angles. So I just want to really instill that, 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 that the grass isn't always greener on the other side of somebody else's perspective because they, because they don't have a different truth than you do. They don't have a different truth than you do. I don't know how you see that, Ray. I don't know if you think that's the all right example, but um, I just, I just want to kind of instill that. So, the point that you're bringing this from is a deep faith. And what I would like to share is to the young man who doesn't um, quite own that deep faith that you can discern objective truth in, uh, I'd like to challenge him to think about that we now choose to define our own system of right and wrong, rationalized into our sinful mindset with no consequence. So what I share with my children is that the only thing that doesn't lie to us is time of day. Anything that we look at around us in our physical world is of man's will. It's not of God's will. And, you know, so many people will condemn, well, how did God let that happen to me? And all these other reasons why they step away from their faith and they step away from a personal relationship that can only bring them closer, because it's of man's will that we live through our trials. This is truth. The only truth that I see in this world is time of day. That's it. Other than that, um, everything could be a situational truth because we're not seeing God's will. We're seeing our will. And uh, one of the big subjects, um, one of the talking points that I bring as a, um, 
a manner in which to find what I'm trying to share here is a book that I once read, uh, Screw Tape Letters. And the way that it's C.S. Lewis and it's um, Screw Tape is a senior demon. He's also the nephew of, uh, excuse me, he's also the uncle to his nephew who is Wormwood. And uh, what it is, is uh, letters that the senior demon uncle writes to his nephew on how to take the will of a man. And it's an amazing book to read. It changed my perspective on many things uh, in my daily life because it talks about so many things, um, the way we view people in, in masks that sit around us, uh, the, the way we view our parents, the way we view um, um, our, our sexuality. So many things are explored. Um, and the only way that it's projected is we don't see any of the letters from the nephew. We only see letters back, short little letters. It's so easy to read this book. You could read a letter at a time, put it down, pick it up. It's, it's a beautiful book to read. But um, you know, we only see the perspective of the uncle to the nephew. So we're getting a direct view, only the direct view of how someone is meant to it on take our soul. And one of the things, um, well, it, one thing I want to bring out is that it's always worked on, we are always worked on through fear, vice, and pride. That's the manner in which we are... Um, compromised our will is compromised within fear vice and pride and so uh this one letter that's written it talks about uh cent cent uh circles um uh the way that we are built as as human beings and he talks about three circles the innermost circle he defines as our will the heart or our foundation the second circle is our intellect or where we reason. And our third circle, the outer circle, is of fantasy. So our second circle is where we reason and um, how we discern and choose what we allow to go into our center circle, our will, our hearts. So it, the way that this letter is written is the uncle is sharing with the nephew that he should push everything that's in that center circle, that, that, excuse me, that second circle out into this outer circle of fantasy so that no virtue can be accepted and sown into what they call the patient, which is uh, a man's will. It's, it's a beautiful chapter to read, and it's a very easy example to understand how this world manipulates us and how it's, it's, a, it's a, a clear picture of how everything is pushed out into fantasy in this world. We look at TV. We believe nothing. There is no virtue. There is no good intent. There is no reflection of good intent. Benevolence. Understand what benevolence means. Benevolence is to conduct within good intent. There's no, there's no reflection of this. So everything for us is pushed out into that circle of fantasy. Um, when when we start to understand the principles of the way that this is described, it gives it lends to us the fortitude to start to discern within our daily um, toilings, our daily uh, activities, interactions, especially at work, how we can discern what is virtuous and what is vice. What you know. Our communities are now in our phones, and what do we allow our 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 will, which is seen through our eyes, to view? All of these things become awarenesses that we could start to discern. Um, uh, <clears throat> living in and of this world lends us to operate prominently in the outer circle of fantasy and compromises our will and our ability to make decisions in humility. Um, um, <clears throat> as, as our cultural norms become more palatable, it becomes harder for each new generation to discern subjective truth from objective truth uh, that you were reading to earlier. So um, 
if if you'd like to explore this with me further, did you have any questions on when you read this portion of this chapter? Well, absolutely. And I think, Ray, first of all, the the book uh, Screw Tape Letters is a fantastic read for anybody. Um, a, a young person that's looking at this um, is is again awoken to that reality of we're inside this fishbowl and we've got to get out of it. And this, this uh, book, the screw tape letters by CS Lewis is fascinating because as you mentioned, the, the senior devil screw tape is showing his other nephew how to rob people of their of their free will. And so I I kind of want to take the approach as you mentioned where okay, you have the will where if it's embedded in your heart, if it's imbe- you you cannot change what's in that will, right? What's in that heart of hearts. But what impacts the will? What impacts your will to do God's will, right? What impacts your will? It's the, it's the things that are fed to us in society. And what do we use? What do we use? We use our intellect. So when you use the intellect to impact your will, if the intellect becomes warped, if the intellect becomes warped, then you have a warped will, right? It just is, Compromise. right? Compromised. 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 Will. Yeah, a compromised will. Yeah, that's probably a better term. It's, you've compromised your will. Uh, and so let's look at what I, what my question to you is, you know, is truth a fantasy is is truth being sold to us in society as a fantasy because then it lends itself into another question then what is reality you know what i mean I, like that was my that was my thing like reading this in the context that you placed it if if truth is the fantasy then what in the world is reality? Because I don't know what reality is if the truth is a fantasy. So can you can kind of talk with us a little bit about that? For a young person coming into themselves, situational truth is all about. There's no real truth that's shown to them in entertainment, in their music, in the world around them, in the way that the, uh, the educational system um, manipulates their thoughts. There's so many um, um, dividing points that need to be discerned. There's, there's too many. If they're doing this journey alone, if they don't have an intentional um, um, someone in front of them to follow, uh, within the masculine journey, it, it's 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 overwhelming. So now, uh, do we see God's will when we look around? It's very much a contrast. Uh, do we see objective truth when we look around? Um, objective truth is something that you have to almost. Uh, that's something that you have to work on, like as if you would a personal relationship or a position at your at your your what you do for a living. You know, uh, objective truth is found in a faith that's lived and and owned. So, objective truth to someone who's not living of the word is very hard to see, because this world manipulates and compromises the will to think that there is no result to our actions. So now, um, when we challenge ourselves uh, daily to think about these newfound competencies and the effects that they can have on our family's trajectory, there's some things that I would like to go into a little further with you. 
um, decisions, good decisions. Um, the court, uh, situational truth is usually found in a cause that a young man or a young woman uh, chooses to align themselves with, with the like-minded people that are around them, with the instant gratification of feeling good about what's being done. Uh, you know, um, faith is something you have to work at. It, it is something that has to be found within humility. Uh, we are not the subject. We are, the, we serve. We don't uh, fulfill. It's it's so much. I'm scratching at things that I hope people are gonna want to move the page on. But um, let's talk about trajectory for a moment. Let's talk about um, decisions, good decisions that lead to good results. And hopefully we could reach a little further into the young man so that he could understand how to discern his thoughts being of his own will. Yeah. So when we approach when we approach life well, um, there's only a few decisions that we can make in life that actually um, uh, affect our trajectory. Our trajectory. What is trajectory? That's uh, it's a path that's that's. Um, set out. It's a course that's already been pre-decided. I say to my children all the time, pre-decide how to approach this. Pre-decide. Pre-decide what's going to be done. Pre-decide the questions that you're going to be asked. Pre-decide the um, events that are going to unfold. So when we look at um, decisions that affect our lives as we um, plot and, and navigate our own trajectory and what our families look like in front of us, there's only a few, and I'm going to choose six to talk about. Uh, education, career, health, where we live, who we marry, and our faith. So I'll go a little deeper on each. In education, that is where we invest in ourselves. Um, the manner in which we invest in ourselves should be within our will. It should be something that we want to follow and not be led in. And we need to find the will within us, the strength, the fortitude to want to uh, discern objective truth within our education. It's very important. It's in a formative years. Our career. Do we choose to live to work or work to live? Our health. Very important. Do we love ourselves? Can we find forgiveness for our sinful nature? Can we understand that we are sinful and be able to separate, separate ourselves from sin? That's a powerful thing. I talk about it a lot because it took me a long time in composure to understand that I can separate myself from sin and sinful mindset. It's something that's grown within wisdom over time. Uh, where we live, do we put our family first? When we as men take our place, our position in life, our families become before us. When we choose where we live, it should be with a clear vision of what our family looks like in front of us. Um, buying a townhouse that's near the city, is if, if that's a temporary thing, it, it, it should be discerned as one, uh, just one talking point to consider. Um, who we marry extremely important and something that you've just lived through discerning whether you unwittingly did it or not. Uh, I believe that you actually with where you are in life discerned before you got married, but what drives us in our wants within our personal relationships, especially within a marriage uh, to discern that, um, you know, St. Saint, uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas said, uh, what we love tells us who we are. Um, you know, how we practice uh, our um, actions, the, the way that we think, the way that we talk, the way that we move uh, is, is shown in um, who we pick as a, a partner in life. Uh, it's what drives our wants. And then faith. Okay. Our faith is a foundation of good intent. If we don't have faith, then where is our intent? Is our intent fueled by the causes of this world? So how do we stay committed to um, seeing out the trajectory that we want to navigate and set out for ourselves? Well, I find that there's three factors that 
need to always be in the equation. Um, it's emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being. Another thing that you'll hear me speak about often, because these are required within any discerning. When we um, only work on our emotional and physical well-being, and we don't work on our spirituality, there's always going to be a hole within inside of us. So the way that we find balance in life is by sharing in and working on all three aspects of these factors that need to become competencies and awarenesses. Emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being is where we find our balance. And it also gives us the fortitude and the courage to face the pains of adversity and even contemplating thinking this way. Because when you explore what you and I are sharing today, Phil, this is a contrast to the worldly view. And you need to find within you a will, a fortitude. Like-minded men, we're not supposed to do this alone. We need to find like-minded men that we can shoulder up to, that we can uh, stay consistent in what we plotted out, what we... Um, uh, decided that we want our family to look like in front of us. I, uh, I wonder if these things that I'm sharing are things that maybe you unwittingly thought about that I'm just bringing to your awareness. What do you think, Bill? Absolutely. I think that the things that you've mentioned here, especially those six areas of key discernment and when we discern those well and when we think about those things well we have are then set on a path that trajectory you talked about and so certainly you have helped me here um rethink about those things rethink rediscover those things in in my life right you know um going through them certainly being intentional in 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 my marriage and being, uh, you know, who, who I married and, and discerned that for sure. Um, the, the other thing that I think, you know, I've, I've discerned well was my education. Um, and of course faith and career, but I think you really need to take some time and, and examine that inwardly, you know, fi how do you find your place in the world? It's through making those good decisions. Um, and, and taking the time to reflect on that as, as a young person, as a young man, is going to help you. Um, so, so really take, take the time. You know, I mean, these, these podcasts are meant, again, as a supplement to the book. They're meant to aid you in your discussion and to walk with faith in your men's groups. Um, and so take this to prayer. Take this to some contemplative thought just in the next, you know, few minutes after the podcast ends, um, I, I want you to do that. I want you to take some time and just sit quietly as, as I, I think you mentioned in the first one, you know, uh, and even in the first chapter or in our discussion, right, where, you know, silence is important. Taking that time to, to have silence, to have that area of reflection in this very busy world, you got to do it, you know. Um, so, so, so just take that time. Uh, after the podcast ends, to sit, be quiet with yourself, and, and reflect on those big choices that you've made or that you're going to make. Right? I think it's so important that you're that that you reflect on the things that you're gonna make. You know, who are you dating now? Uh, where are you living now? What is important about that? And you know, I have a note here in my book that I that I wrote in there um, and it was a question but I think through our discussion it's been answered uh, I, I asked the question does intentionality change the notion of moral relativism does being intentional about making decisions in your life change the notion of moral relativism and I, I think the greatest enemy of moral relativism is when we are intentional and we walk through it step by step by step by step because when we are intentional about our actions, about our thoughts, and about 
and about when we begin to think about our future as men, when we begin to do that, moral relativism crumbles because we are led to the truth. We are led to the truth. As I kind of talked about earlier, we're, we're led to that unavoidable thing that is called the truth, no matter what perspective we come at it from. So, so yes, Ray, I, I, I really do think you awoken. I think you've awoken a lot of consciences. I think you've awoken a lot of people um, just in, in just in our conversation and, and in this chapter. Um, and, and now we can kind of see that our thoughts may not be our own until we do that, right? Is that kind of the, the, the right way to approach this? So I really appreciate listening to uh, what you add to the conversation. One of the things that I'd like to stress off of our first chapter is that when is when intent is viewed in the way that you and I are describing it, it should be looked at as virtue. It should be looked at as something that is worthy of exploring and reasoning within. And also... Um, Without faith in God and the realization of his truth, no other truth can be reasoned. And that's a takeaway that I hope a young man would be able to um, find closer to uh, his own thoughts now that you and I have explored this chapter. The question that you asked earlier of me uh, can now be answered. Yes, um, uh, our thoughts are not our own, and the points that we viewed, that we explored, prove to a young man who's coming into himself that he needs to be intentional. He needs to find virtue. He needs to understand what vice is, sinful mindset, how to separate himself from sin. All of these awarenesses that he now has that we only can scratch at, he needs to turn the page on. When this is over, when you and I come to the end of this conversation, he needs to continue it with other like-minded men. We have in place for him to come into our community of TRJ Father's Guide. He can come and he can join in the Twitter, the Instagram, the the Facebook pages, all of it surrounding TRJ Father's Guide, so he can have good intent shared within his daily life, where it's not him being bombarded with the messages of this world that are meant to compromise his will. And hopefully we ignited within him something that will drive him to come to our next conversation in Chapter 3. Uh, let's see what chapter three is. The wedges of this world. What a great lead-in for um, for us to explore the wedges that uh, we just touched on in in this chapter. Exactly, exactly. You know, each of these builds beautifully, right? And I I want to um, remind our listeners again that the website is trjfathersguide.com. As Ray mentioned to you, go there and plug in the community of men uh, that is there so that you can get those messages and things. And I also really encourage you uh, to find that men's group, right? To find the men's group in your parish or, you know what, even if you don't have one in your parish, start one. Start one or just get a group of friends and go talk at a coffee shop. These are important conversations to be had. Do a book study. As as Ray, you know, mentioned in the first episode uh, of the of this podcast, he said, you know, men's groups don't work, and men's books don't work, and and why is it? It's because men don't necessarily take the time and the effort to be intentional, and in in their life. So we're challenging you as men to be intentional, and if you haven't got a copy of the book yet, if you haven't listened to the first episode yet, go back, listen to the first episode, get a copy of this book. It, all the information can be found at trjfathersguy.com. It's not very hard. You can even go on your phone right now as you're listening to the podcast and do it. 
And as that happens, you're going to continue to walk with this community of people. And at the end of this, I know that you're going to be changed and different and be able to help other people in the world become great faith-filled fathers and become holy men. Ray, I, I just want to thank you for your time, your dedication to this. Uh, it's truly an awesome, awesome conversation to be had with you. And I really appreciate all that you do uh, for, for me and for, and for this conversation and for our listeners. I'd just like to challenge our listeners uh, that they should um, consider to reflect into and not mirror the world around them to find benevolence, understand what it is, have good intent. Um, when, when, when somebody uh, reflects poorly on you, instead of mirroring that person, find pity on them that they're not sharing in what we are sharing in this fellowship now. And the way that we ripple into the community around us is by starting with the good intent that we find within exploring our free will. Beautiful. Ray, thank you so much. It is truly a treasured and grace-filled conversation that I'm having with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for this time and fellowship. Well, this has been an episode of Tools to Ready the Journey, a Father's Guide to a Faithful Family. For Ray Haywood, I'm Bill Snyder. Be intentional. You've been listening to Tools to Ready the Journey, presented by Breadbox Media. For more information about this ministry to young men, visit trjfathersguide.com or search for TRJ Father's Guide on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Tools to Ready the Journey is a production of Patchwork Heart Ministry. To learn more about how Patchwork Heart Ministry can support your ministry, visit patchworkheart.org.